we prone the calendar. Uh, everybody is ready for trial uh, for the hearing. Uh, so the state call, state of Georgia call that for the witness. Judge, before I do that, if I can make some introductory remarks and comment on some of the things that the court has done with your permission. Sure. I would also note that. Sorry to interrupt you. No, you can't interrupt and sit down, Mr. Counselor. Thank you. Go ahead. Your Honor, I have a motion pending before you, you, the court. You may, pen, you may alter that later. Okay, go ahead. Judge, this is, as you noted, the state of Georgia versus Travis McMichael, Greg McMichael, and uh, William Roddy Bryan. I note for our record, because we need to make a record here, that uh, we have two of the defendants who are seated in the courtroom, it would appear, at the uh, Glenn County Adult Detention Center. One of them is off camera at the request of defense counsel and with a uh, waiver. Um, we do have one witness from the state's perspective that we intend to call in just a moment. Uh, we are here from the Cobb County District Attorney's Office on behalf of District Attorney Joy at Holmes who is seated behind us. And uh, we are representing the state of Georgia based on the Attorney General Chris Carr's order that uh, appointed us as the special prosecuting agency on the case. So I wanted to make a record as to who we are and why we're here. I am Jesse Evans and I am the major crimes prosecutor for the Cobb County DA's office. And this is Linda Dunikoski who's here with us today to handle this. Um, as you noted, Judge, due to the statewide judicial emergency issued by the Supreme Court, uh, we have followed the court's guidance and wore our masks into court today. We appreciate the fact that in order to make a record and for our court reporter to take things down, it might be necessary as we're speaking to remove those masks temporarily as I've done now. And we appreciate the court understanding that that's uh, sometimes required, even despite the Judicial Emergency Act, so that we can make a proper record in these proceedings that were requested by defense counsel and by the defendants in this case, not by the state. Um, we have come here today for the purpose of the probable cause hearing, and uh, this preliminary hearing we're prepared to go forward, as the, the state has said. Um, they are essentially challenging the probable cause for the issuance of certain arrest warrants for the defendants in this case. Um, we have no objection to one of the defendants not being present virtually or, or in court uh, due to the rest request of counsel uh, and the fact that they've expressly set a waiver here, um, that we acknowledge the fact that had they insisted on the presence, we could certainly have made accommodations so that he too could be remotely, um, for lack of a better term, zoomed in or Skyped in, whatever this technological system is. Um, today, though we're acting as the special prosecution in the case, we're here essentially on the behalf of the citizens of Glenn County to talk about the fatal shooting of the February 23rd incident involving victim Ahmad Arbery, um, who was chased, hunted down, and ultimately executed. We believe the evidence will show based on what's about to be presented to the court. Um, that's our purpose for being here today. I will tell the court that yesterday during a status conference involving the lawyers, there was one of the defense attorneys for um, Defendant Brian that articulated some speculation as to how this court might rule on some things, which was a little bit troubling from the state's perspective. Uh, other than yesterday meeting face to face, that's the first opportunity we had to meet you, Judge, and we appreciate the professionalism that you've shown us and the courtesy that you've shown us here in Glenn County. Um, but I did want to at least state for the record, since the record was silent yesterday, that we were concerned about um, that articulation. We don't know what the basis for that would be, um, but we're certainly ready to go forward at this point. We believe this court to be a, a reasonable court by all of our dealings with you um, to date, and uh, we're prepared to call our witness and defend our probable cause for the issuance of these arrest warrants here. Um, but I wanted to make those prefatory remarks and also articulate the public that may be watching why it is that there might be times that we do not have our masks on and it, it is important in these criminal matters that we make records and that we have court reporters take those things down and sometimes it's more uh, it's easier to do that when the masks are temporarily removed so I didn't want to be silent on that point in the face of the national and worldwide crisis that we're dealing with this pandemic thank you With that, Judge, um, absent any other remarks from any other counsel at this point, we call Richard Dial from the Georgia Bureau of Investigations to the witness stand. Where's your right hand, Lisa? You swear to tell the truth and the whole truth, so help you God. I do. You may be seated. 
All right, sir, thank you for removing your mask for purposes of making the record, but I'll ask that you keep it handy if there becomes a point in time where you're no longer testifying, then we may ask you to put that back on while you remain in the courtroom. Understood? I do. Yes, sir. To the degree you're able, I want you to use the microphone beside you so that we can make a good record so that everybody can hear you. Um, first of all, if you will, introduce yourself to the court. Spell your first and last name for the benefit of our court reporter. Certainly. I'm Special Agent Richard Dial, R-I-C-H-A-R-D. Dial is D-I-A-L. I'm Assistant Special Agent in charge with the Georgia Bureau of Investigation assigned to the Kingsland Field Office, which covers Glen County. Have you been tasked with being the lead investigator on the investigation involving the fatal shooting of Ahmaud Arbery from February of 2020? Yes, sir. I am the case agent. Before we get into the facts supporting your arrest warrants that were issued in this case, will you please articulate briefly a little bit about your background that uh, uh, allows you to serve as an investigator with the Georgia Bureau of Investigations? Um, certainly. I was hired as uh, a narcotics agent with the Georgia Bureau of Investigation in 2001. I was subsequently um, promoted into a special agent position. I had been with the Georgia Bureau Investigation that entire time, which is approximately 19 years. Uh, throughout that time, <coughs> approximately 17 years of that, I've been assigned to the Region 14 Field Office where I've worked a variety of investigations. In this particular case, you're not the only agent working on the case from the Georgia Bureau of Investigations. Is that accurate? And that's correct. There was a team of agents. Um, assisting me in the investigation. And as we sit here now, can you confirm for the record and for the benefit of the judge that while arrest warrants have been issued, there are certain aspects of the case that are continue to be under investigation? That's correct, sir. It's still an ongoing investigation. Uh, I have copies of the arrest warrants in this particular case for the defendants, including the two McMichaels as well as Mr. Bryan. Are you the affiants who swore out those affidavits for arrest for these defendants? I am, yes. And if I am correct, the date of the offenses that we are here to discuss today are February the 23rd of 2020. Is that correct? That is correct. And just to get past these basic background information before I open it up to you for the facts, will you confirm that you have arrest warrants charging Travis and Michael with felony murder based on aggravated assault as well as aggravated assault? I did, yes, sir. And then can you also confirm that Greg McMichael is charged with felony murder based on being party to the crime of aggravated assault as well as party to the crime of aggravated assault? Yes, that's correct. And then finally, the, um, chronologically, the last warrant that was obtained by you and your agency is against William, sometimes referred to as Roddy Bryan, correct? Correct, yes, sir. And that warrant, those warrants charge him with felony murder and criminal attempt to commit false imprisonment, is that correct? That is correct. The location of the fatal shooting of Ahmad Arbery in this particular case, what is that a, a essential cross-section of those streets? It's going to be Holmes Road and Sotilla Drive. That is in Brunswick, Georgia, and Glen County. Holmes is H-O-L-M-E-S, correct? Yes, sir. And Sotilla, S-A-T-I-L-L-A, for the benefit of our court reporter? Yes, sir. That's correct. And can you confirm for me that that is in Brunswick and in Glen County, Georgia? Yes, sir, it is. Uh, today, you have a monitor in front of you. Do you see two of the defendants mm -hmm. present virtually? I do, yes, sir. And, and they have masks on, but do you recognize who those two are? I do. Travis McMichael is seated on the left in a um, striped shirt, and Greg McMichael is in a jacket and tie, seated on the right. Okay. All right, I, I want to ask you some uh, questions about when you got involved in the investigation. Yes, sir. First of all, was the GBI asked to be involved with this case at the outset, or did that come about later? No, so that came about later. Can you briefly articulate, for the benefit of the court and for our court reporter, um, how that is that you came to be involved in the investigation and why that was delayed somewhat? Um, certainly. On, um, this case was originally investigated by the Glen County Police Department. Um, subsequent to that, the district attorneys recused themselves uh, for this circuit. A, uh, another district attorney was assigned, and that district attorney recused himself and was assigned to a third district attorney. My agency on May 5th, 2020, contacted that district attorney, um, offered our assistance. The district attorney was Tom Durden, and we offered our assistance. He uh, availed himself of our assistance and requested us to become involved in the investigation. And then on May 6th, 2020, I was contacted and assigned the investigation. All right. You've had an opportunity now to review Glenn County's initial response to the shooting, correct? I did, yes. Sir. And I assume you've talked to witnesses and had your agents talk to witnesses in um, support of the arrest warrants that you obtained in this particular case? Yes, sir. 
briefly, I want to talk about the deceased victim in this case. Will you tell the court what his name was and a little bit about his background? Certainly. His name was Ahmad Aubrey. He was 25 years of age. He was a resident here in Brunswick, Georgia. He lived at 140 Boykin Ridge Drive at the time of his death with his mother. He was, um, and he was involved in athletics, liked to play games outside. He liked to run, uh, liked to play video games. As part of your investigation of this case, were you able to determine the approximate distance from Ahmad Arbery's home to the place where he was fatally shot on Satilla and Holmes? Um, well, yes. I actually took a driving measurement from um, his residence to where um, the house under construction was located, um, which is at play in this investigation, and that's located at 220 Satilla Drive, and it was approximately 1.8 miles. The scene of the shooting is a little further down the road, approximately two and a half miles would be my estimate. I want to ask you some more background information now about the defendants in this case, and we'll start with Travis McMichael. Um, Travis McMichael, were you able to determine what his age was? I was, yes. Travis McMichael, he um, is 34 years of age. He resided with his father, his mother, and his sister at 230 Satilla Drive in Brunswick, Georgia. And um, did he have some prior training in the Coast Guard? Yes. Um, he served in the Coast Guard as a boarding officer who's um, involved with the interdiction of vessels. Um, he had trained reference to that, and that's the position that he held. You had mentioned that he lived on Satilla Drive with his father. What is his father's name, please? His father's name is Greg McMichael. How old was he at the time of the commission of these crimes? Uh, 64 years of age. And did they live together? They did. Uh, can you tell the court a little bit about the background of Greg McMichael, the father in this case? Yes, uh, Greg McMichael is, uh, was a retired, is a retired investigator with the Bunjuk Judicial Circuit. He served in that position for a number of years. Prior to that, he served as an officer with the Glen County Police Department. Um, he also served as an officer with the Brunswick Police Department and with the Department of Natural Resources for a short time. I want to ask you, um, was, was he an officer for some period of time with the same agency that was initially called upon to investigate the fatal shooting of Ahmaud Arbery? Yes, he was. He was an investigator for a number of years with the Brunswick Judicial Circuit and actually retired as an investigator from the Brunswick Judicial Circuit, which was one of the reasons for their recusal themselves from the case. And specifically, did he at some point in his background also work for Glen County Police Department? He did, yes. Sir. I want to turn our attention now to the third defendant, uh, William Roddy Bryan, and ask a little bit about his background. Can you articulate for the court where he lived and a little bit about his age and his background? Um, certainly. Um, William Bryan, he resided at 307 uh, Burford Road, which is in the same um, housing uh, area, the same neighborhood as uh, Satilla Drive. He was he's, uh, 50 years of age. Uh, he was employed as a small engine mechanic at the time of this incident. Before I turn our attention to the actual date of the crimes in your arrest warrant, I want to talk about the Satilla Shores neighborhood. Are you familiar with it? I am, yes, sir. And um, you had already mentioned on your direct examination previously reference to a home that was under construction. Can you please explain to the court the significance of that home and where it was located? Yes, that um, residence is at 220 Satilla Drive. It belonged to a gentleman by the name of Larry English. It was a home under construction. Um, I believe Greg McMichael in one of the interviews refers to it as a shell of a house. Um, he was in the process of constructing this home as you go into Satilla Shores neighborhood. Um, you go down a short way and it's on the right. It's as you come in. This home is important in this investigation because um, the deceased victim in this investigation, Amata Albury, um, had been seen inside that home on security camera footage prior to the shooting incident. And on the day of the shooting incident, the neighbor had seen him inside of the home uh, that's under construction and had called 911 prior to the rest of the events taking place. Focusing now on that home, you said that the home was under construction. Was it secured or unsecured at the time of the shooting? Unsecured. And um, when I say unsecured, describe for the court its, its state. Um, it, the upper walls of the house and the windows were in the house. 
There are no interior walls, it's studs. This, we didn't have this from the security camera footage that shows the interior of the residence. There was no garage, or does not appear to be there was any garage doors on the house, which is actually attached to the house. In the video, we couldn't tell if it had a front door or not, but it's very obvious that individuals were able to walk through there without any, any being impeded in any way. In fact, have you found as part of your investigation other videos showing other people that walked through this unsecure residence at different times? Yes, sir. Um, besides Mott Aubrey, we have discovered video of at least two other groups of people that have been inside the residence um, with the interference construction. Was anyone living at that house at the time of this crime? No, it was going to be a vacation house that was under construction. Um, there was a small trailer in the backyard. Um, which was secured, but um, for when the owner who resides in another county would come and work on the house, he'd have a place to stay. But it's been under construction for quite a while. Okay. And um, to your knowledge, uh, was anything ever taken um, from this house based on the video footage that you've seen? No, I think um, there were some kids in there that I believe took a couple pieces of wood from the house, um, but uh, that was on video. But other than that, no. Um, there's nothing I saw in the video nor that Mr. English has told us during interviews he can say was taken from the house. And has the owner been interviewed by the Georgia Bureau of Investigation? Yes, he's been interviewed um, at least two separate times by two different agents in reference to this case. You had mentioned that Mr. Aubrey was an avid runner. Is that accurate? It is. And have you talked to multiple people, you and your agency, who confirmed that running was one of the things that he did? For yes, very much. For health and for, for just his mental state? Yes, sir. he just enjoyed running his what we're getting from numerous witnesses and the family, friends of his. In conversations with the homeowner of this house under construction, was there ever any discussion with him about water sources that might be there if somebody wanted to get a drink of water, um, say, during a run? I'm aware that the homeowner, Larry English, or, or through his attorney, has made statements concerning their speculation that um, there are water sources at the house and that could be a reason for Mr. Aubrey's entering the house. Um, that is not captured on video, but I'm aware of that statements that they have made. On the date in question, now turning to February 23rd of 2020, you had talked about video. Is there uh, multiple sources of video surveillance that's been uh, reviewed from the Satilla Shores neighborhood from which we were able to piece together a timeline of what happened? Yes, sir. That's correct. Uh, different locations, not just this house that you referenced? No, yeah, there's different locations. Um, neighbors and other sources of video we have that help show the events that occurred. All right, I now want to uh, direct your attention to specifically February the 23rd of 2020, uh, the date that is the subject of your arrest warrant for the three defendants in this case. Were you able, looking at all of the evidence and speaking to all of the witnesses, to piece together a chronology of how Ahmad Armory, uh, Armory excuse me, Arbery came to be a shot at Satilla Shores. Uh, yes, sir, I have. Would you briefly and succinctly articulate for the court um, what it is that you were able to piece together from your investigation in this case? Certainly. From the surveillance video across the street from the house that's under construction, you see Mr. Aubrey coming up to the house, going directly into the house. Um, from the interior video of the house, you see him just wandering around, again, not taking anything. It just, he's just walking around, looking around inside the um, under construction building. The neighbor across the street, uh, Mr. Albanez, he, um, you can see him on the video coming forward and there are interviews with him. He saw Mr. Aubrey going in the house, so he calls 911. Um, at that point, um, the call is dispatched, and in, during the call, it's actually logged as somebody's in the open construction site. So Mr. Albanez sees him in there. You know, from the video, you can tell that Mr. Aubrey comes out of the residence. Um, and goes running down the street. Um, from the interviews conducted by Glen County PD, and you can actually see it on the video, um, Mr. Greg McMichael was in his front yard. You, you don't see him, but you see he says he's in his front yard working on some cushions for his boat. When he sees Mr. Aubrey running down the street, um, during his interview with Glen County PD, he doesn't say he says that he didn't know if Aubrey was chasing somebody or somebody was chasing him, but he recognized Aubrey from previous video he had seen from February 11th as somebody that was inside this house that's under construction. I want to talk about that previous video since you broached that topic. Um, did Satilla Shores have a Facebook page during which residents were talking about that property and other things? Uh, yes, yes they did. 
Did you find any um, discussions about uh, the fact that somebody may have been in that residence previous to this? Yes, there was some discussion about it on the Facebook page as well as on the February 11th report that was filed by the officer who responded to the person in there. He makes note that the person's information was on that Facebook page. And um, now getting back to the chronology of February the 23rd of 2020, articulate for the court what your investigation revealed in terms of Mr. Arbery running past the McMichaels household. Okay. Mr. Aubrey proceeds past the household. He's running down Satilla Drive um, south. Um, Greg McMichael goes inside, according to his statement and Travis McMichael's statement, tells Travis McMichael that the guy's running down the road. They both grab their weapons. Greg McMichael arms himself with a Smith & Wesson 686 357 Magnum revolver. Travis McMichael arms himself with a Remington 870 pump 12 gauge shotgun. They then enter um, Travis McMichael's truck, Travis McMichael is driving, Greg McMichael is in the passenger seat. This is according to both their statements. Um, then on the video you see them come out of the driveway and turn in the direction that Ahmaud Aubrey was running. I want to pause there at this point. You had mentioned a previous 911 call involving the residence that was under construction, correct? Yes. Uh, were either of the McMichaels the 911 caller for that initial call about the, the structure? Uh, no, um, the, the the person that called was Matt, Matt Albanese. Neither Travis or Greg McMichael has called 911 at that point. And that's what I want to be clear on. So my follow-up question to you is, when the defendants, uh, the McMichaels, armed themselves with this revolver and shotgun, did they make a 911 call before going after Mr. Aubrey? No, sir, they did not. So there was no 911 call initially by them as they gave chase? That's correct. Can you describe the vehicle that the Michaels were in? Yes, they were in a white Ford F-150 2019 model that belonged to Travis McMichael. Per statements of the defendants and video that you reviewed, can you articulate for the court whether there was any time in which the McMichaels were able to catch up to the deceased victim in this case? Yes, according to both their statements and we have video of them, they called up with Ahmad Aubrey as he was um, running. He actually runs down Satilla Drive. Satilla Drive takes a turn, but if you continue straight, it turns into Burford, which is uh, the street where Mr. Bryan uh, resides. They catch up to him. Um, according to Travis and Greg McMichaels, they're giving commands to Ahmad Aubrey to stop. Um, this is captured at, at, when this is going on, Mr. Bryan is outside of his residence and he has a, video, a surveillance video camera that captures this shooting down his driveway. So you see um, Travis McMichael's truck and Ahmaud Aubrey at the, in his driveway, and according to um, Mr. Bryan's statement as well, um, he sees them uh, trying to uh, pursue in Ahmaud Aubrey. In the video, you actually see Ahmaud Aubrey trying to get away. He's running backwards, the truck would move backwards, and he's moving forward. He's trying to escape at that point in the video. Um, According to Mr. Bryan's statement, he then he does not he does not know Travis McMichael. He has met Greg McMichael, but he didn't recognize Greg McMichael at that time because Greg McMichael was in the passenger seat of the truck. But he recognized the truck as a truck that's in the neighborhood. So then he yells, "Do you got him?" Um, when you say he yells, "Do you got him?" Who are you referring to? Bryan is yelling to the person in the truck who he doesn't know. Um, he doesn't get a response, Mr. Bryan his statement then goes into his residence gets the keys to his truck comes out and cranks up his truck with the intention of uh, assisting in the pursuit so at that point Roddy Bryan makes the decision to enter his residence correct yes get his keys. yes and then what kind of vehicle does he get in to join the pursuit of Mr. Aubrey the deceased victim he is in a 2018 Chevy Silverado gray in color at this point in time based on our best evidence has any 911 call been placed by either the McMichaels or the Bryan? No, none have. Can you uh, describe as best you're able, I know it's a convoluted situation, we're going to get to a map in a second, but to describe for the purpose of a record the best you're able, the sequence of events thereafter as these two pickup trucks at Satilla Shores are chasing Mr. Arbery? Yes, um, Mr. Arbery continued heading down Burford Road away from Satilla Drive. Um, Travis McMichael and Greg McMichael are following him. 
Um, again, Mr. Uh, Brian is then getting his keys and getting his vehicle cranked. Um, at one point, uh, Mr. Aubrey turns and goes back the way he was running in, a way, in an attempt to avoid the McMichaels. Greg McMichael, who had been riding in the passenger seat of Travis Michael's truck, he's actually sitting on a child's car seat during this, at this point. He exits the vehicle with the intention of um, confronting Mr. Aubrey. Mr. Aubrey is running back down the road at this point. So according to Greg McMichael and Travis McMichael's statement, Greg McMichael comes back to Travis McMichael's truck and tells him, you know, go back, you know, um, back up, back up, you know, trying to encourage Travis McMichael to back the vehicle up and engage um, Mr. Aubrey. At this time, Mr. Bryan is, he is coming out of his driveway. His vehicle was actually backed in his driveway. So the front of his vehicle is facing the front of his driveway. So when he pulls out on the road, he sees Mr. Aubrey coming and he pulls his vehicle out in an attempt to block Mr. Aubrey in. That's according to his statement as well as um, Travis McMichael's statement. At that point, Travis McMichael makes the decision. He tells Greg McMichael, no, jump in. And his decision is to circle around Buford Road because it circles around and actually becomes another road, Zellwood, but it circles around and his intention is to get and cut off um, Mr. Aubrey um, where Holmes Road cuts into Satilla Drive. And it's kind of, it's just, we'll just make a loop and cut him off from that way, if that makes sense. So, Greg McMichael hops into the back bed of the truck um, because of the car seat situation and they in, then go and start circling around the block pretty much to cut him off. At this time, like I said, Mr. Bryant has pulled his vehicle blocking the road trying to block Mr. Aubrey and Mr. Aubrey goes around his bumper, his truck. According to Mr. Bryant's statement, he then pulls out on the road and makes several more attempts to try to block in Amon Aubrey, trying to detain him. I want to ask you a couple questions before we leave this point. Yes, At sir. this point, have the two trucks separated from each other? Yes, sir, they have. And um, you had mentioned Mr. Bryan's statement to you all. Did he talk about his attempts to sort of run uh, Mr. Arbery off the road or push him off the road using his vehicle? Yes, he, he made several statements about trying to block him in and using his vehicle to try to um, stop him. Um, his statement was that Mr. Um, Aubrey kept trying, kept come, jumping out of the way and moving around the bumper and actually running down into the ditch in an attempt to avoid his truck. At um, various points during this chronology that you're articulating for the court and our record, um, based on the evidence you've seen, including some video footage, were you able to determine that using these two pickup trucks during the whole event, uh, Mr. Arbery's path of travel was essentially redirected by the actions of the defendants? Yes, sir, very much. Um, Mr. Bryan, so Mr. Aubrey gets, if I can explain. Sure. Okay. Mr. Aubrey goes around Mr. Bryan's truck as he's pulling out. At this point, Mr. Aubrey is heading back the way he's come, which would lead him out of the Satilla Shores neighborhood. Mr. Bryan makes statements that he continues to try to block in Mr. Aubrey. Um, Mr. Aubrey takes a right turn onto Holmes Road, and Mr. Bryan is actually overshoots him going Satilla. So at this point, Mr. Aubrey is trying to avoid Mr. Bryan, and he turns down Holmes Road, which is actually going sideways back into the neighborhood instead of uh, out, which is the way he was traveling. Um, Mr. Bryan then uh, remaneuvers his vehicle and pursues Mr. Aubrey down Holmes Road. I want to be clear on that point. As you go down Holmes Road, ha had Mr. Aubrey been allowed to um, finish that path of travel, was there any uh, direction that could be made to get back to the exit of that neighborhood? Yes, if he went down to Holmes Road, he could have caught Zellwood and then gone back up again to still drive and going back out to Satilla Shore. So pretty much he could have gone straight, but he cut and would have had to circle back around. But he could have still escaped the neighborhood at that point. At some point in time, um, I know that a video was started by Mr. Bryan. Is that accurate? That is, yes, sir. And he's confirmed as much, and we have copies of that video from his cell phone, correct? That, that's correct, yes, sir. Uh, there's been portions of that video that were played um, widely on television, but it, there's actually other portions to that video as well, correct? That is correct. Can you please articulate for the court what you were able to see uh, and confirm with Mr. Bryan about what he did as Mr. Arbery was heading down Holmes Road away from uh, Mr. Bryan's vehicle? Yeah, so Mr. Bryan's pursuing Mr. Arbery down Holmes Road, <clears throat> again with the intention of trying to catch up him and block him in. Um, at this point, while going down Holmes Road, Mr. Bryan turns on his cell phone camera and begins to try to videotape 
of Mr. Aubrey. Uh, Mr. Aubrey stops. Now at this time, the McMichaels have turned off of Zellwood and are coming down from Holmes Road. So you've got one vehicle coming one way down Holmes Road and another vehicle coming another way and Mr. Aubrey is in between. So at some point, Mr. Aubrey turns around and starts heading back towards Mr. Bryan. Um, based upon the statement, it, it appears that Mr. McMichael is coming. Mr. Aubrey's running, sees Mr. McMichael's truck, and then turns around and uh, runs back by Mr. Bryan's truck. Um, Mr. Bryan gets out of the way as uh, Aubrey runs past him, and then he sees the McMichaels come forward. Now, at this point in the video, Mr. Bryan has put the video down, so you don't have video um, of this sequence of events. But this is according to um, Mr. Bryan's statement that uh, Aubrey runs past his truck, then the Bryans come past his, sorry, sorry, then the McMichaels come past his truck. Then Mr. Bryan pulls out and again goes back down in the direction of that uh, Mr. Aubrey had traveled. But before we leave this, this topic here, was any of this um, captured on the video before the, the phone was put down? Could, could you actually see Mr. Aubrey trying to uh, evade the truck? Yes, sir, you can. Okay, and um, did you see him turn around and try to get away from the truck before it, it turned around? I'm, I'm referring, uh, obviously, to Mr. Bryan's truck. Yes, sir. And um, I know that you just said that the video was put down at some point and couldn't see, but were you able to capture any audio? Yes, you can hear um, the different uh, gears changing in the engine, moving in the vehicle, yes. All right, and then um, along those lines as well, during the the portions of the interview where Mr. Bryan was interviewed both by Glenn County Police Department and members of the Georgia Bureau of Investigations, did he make any admissions to you that his vehicle had any contact with the deceased victim and any damage as a result there from? Yes, um, he indicated at one point that his vehicle had contact with the victim. Um, his impression was that the, Mr. Aubrey had been trying to open the driver's side door but had did not got to the driver's side door. Um, he made that statement initially. The Glen County Police Department that day actually photographed the truck. You can see some palm prints appear to be swipes on the um, rear pass uh, driver's side door. It's his truck is a four-door truck, right? So it's there's some um, swipe marks and palm prints there. There is also white cotton fibers along the um, truck bed where the bed liner lips over the bed of the truck, there's a little bit of plastic in that bed liner. There is white cotton fibers along it, which um, Mr. Aubrey, during this pursuit and incident, was wearing a white cotton shirt. Um, the, there was also a dent directly below those white cotton fibers, and um, that dent would attributed to contact with Mr. Aubrey because of its location. In and did Mr. Bryan confirm during his interviews that the, that the dent was actually as a result of the vehicle making contact with him? I believe that that was his surmise. Okay. I'm not 100% sure on that. Turning now to the situation we have involving the two pickup trucks. After Mr. Bryan turned around, can you confirm that both pickup trucks were essentially facing the same direction on Holmes? Yes, they were. Both. Uh, it was, Tra it was Mr. Al Mr. Aubrey running back down Holmes towards the <coughs> drive, Travis McMichael driving his truck directly behind Mr. Aubrey, and then um, there was uh, Mr. Bryan behind Travis McMichael's truck. At some point, Travis McMichael's truck gets ahead of Mr. Aubrey. What happens when the McMichael's truck gets ahead of the victim? <sighs> this their vehicle gets ahead of Mr. Aubrey, then they stop their vehicle, and this is almost at the intersection of Sotilla Drive and Holmes Road. They stop. Is this a public roadway? It is. Where is Mr. Bryan's vehicle located during this portion of the chase? Um, Mr. Bryan's vehicle is behind Mr. Aubrey. Mr. Aubrey at this point is between um, Travis McMichael's vehicle and Mr. Bryan's vehicle. Is Mr. Bryan able to video any portion of what happens next? He is. Have you reviewed that video and do you have it? I do, and I have. Can you please describe the chronology of events after the McMichaels parked their vehicle in the middle of this public roadway as Mr. Arbery approached the back of that vehicle? Yes, I can. Mr. Bryan began, picks up the phone, it's been videotaping the whole time, and, and holds it up so you have a view. Um, you see Mr. Arbery running down Holmes Road, going towards Satilla Drive, you see Travis McMichael's truck is parked in the road. Travis McMichael, 
The driver's side door is open. Travis Michael is there. Um, it is apparent to me he is holding a firearm. His arm is raised. It's in a pointed um, position um, at one point. Then Travis, I'm sorry, then Mr. Aubrey is running. He then apparently sees what uh, Travis Michael in front of him. Then he changes direction to go around the passenger side of the vehicle. Rather than going to the driver's side where you had seen Travis McMichael with the shotgun, he's now going to the opposite side of that truck that's parked in this public roadway. That's correct. He's going around the truck. What happened after that? Travis McMichael then moved from the driver's side where he's actually standing. When you open the driver's side door, the door is at his back initially in the video, and he's got the shotgun. He then positions himself around the driver's side door towards the front of the truck. Um, you see um, Mr. Aubrey running alongside the passenger side. And again, you see uh, Travis McMichael has reposed himself on the front of the truck. Mr. Aubrey then comes up to a position, sees Travis McMichael, then makes a decision and turns and decides to engage Travis McMichael. What happens after that? Um, as he turns and goes towards Travis McMichael, you hear a shot. Then um, you see Travis McMichael moving backwards with um, Mr. Aubrey. Um, obviously, they are engaged in a physical confrontation at this point. Um, they go off the screen. You then hear a second shot where you see blood and um, spray into the screen, a mist of it. <coughs> then they come back in to the um, view of the camera. There, um, <coughs> Mr. Aubrey is striking Travis McMichael. There's a struggle going on, and then you see a uh, then you see a third shot occur. Um, the firearm being lower down like that. You see the, after the third shot. You then see Mr. Aubrey get past Travis McMichael and continue running down Holmes, almost right there at the intersection, and then he falls. You uh, articulated three separate gunshots here, correct? Yes. Where was Greg McMichael at the time that this was going on? Greg McMichael was in the back of the pickup truck uh, when the situation began. He was on the phone. At this point, have they finally called 911? They have, yes. And um, was he armed at that time? He was. Um, as the confrontation began, he uh, drops the phone or puts the phone down and then pulls his weapon. And he has his weapon during the parts of the confrontation occurred. When you talk about his weapon, are you referring to the 357 revolver that you had articulated earlier during this hearing? I am. And of note, um, can you tell the court and make a record about and any significance about that weapon as even mentioned by um, Greg McMichael in terms of where he got it. Yes, that was the same 686 Smith & Wesson 357 Magnum revolver that he carried when he was an officer with the Glen County Police Department and it stamped Glen County uh, GCPD. Did he um, articulate that he was a former law enforcement officer to Glen County Police officers when they arrived and is that captured on body cam video? It is, he said it several times. And did he mention also several times that that was a gun that would have been issued by Glen County Police Department? He did. You mentioned three gunshot wounds in this particular case. Can you articulate for the court and the benefit of our record where those gunshot wounds were to Mr. Aubrey's body? I can. Mr. Aubrey suffered a gunshot wound to the center of the chest. He also suffered a gunshot wound to the upper left chest around the armpit area here, um, again though, um, from the front to the back. He then suffered a shotgun to wound to his right wrist. I want to talk about um, other things that were collected by Glen County Police Department. And again, you, you, this was not your crime scene in that you were asked to participate in this investigation later, correct? That's correct. You're aware, though, that certain items of evidence of significance were correct, collected in this case by Glen County Police Department? I am, yes, sir. How about the firearm? Yes. Um, well, Travis McMichael's firearm was collected by the Glen County Police Department. And how many spent uh, shell casings do we have from that shotgun? Three. Uh, two of them were expelled. Is that accurate? That is correct. What about the third one? Where did that remain? It was still within the chamber of the weapon. And give a description briefly for the benefit of the court and the record about what type of firearm that was that was used to shoot Mr. Arbery. Eight, the 870, Remington 870 12-gauge shotgun is a pump-action shotgun, meaning that to uh, once a shot is fired, the front forearm of the weapon has to be 
operated to eject the spent um, shell, and then the forearm has to be operated again to load a new live round in. Um, during uh, Travis McMichael's interview with police, did he make any admissions about firing the fatal gunshots in this particular case? He did. He admitted firing the weapon three times. And um, the first shot that he articulated, where did he indicate to police that that shot landed? The chest, Mr. Albert's chest. So the first shot that Mr. M Travis McMichael said um, that was inflicted on Mr. Arthur was one of the chest wounds that you articulated here, correct? That is correct. And um, is there video uh, evidence that you saw that tends to corroborate based on your observation that that is an, an accurate statement that the chest wound was, or at least one of the chest wounds was the first shot that was um, fired at the deceased victim, Mr. Arbery? Yes, sir, there is. Can you articulate for the court how, how that is, that you're able to see that? After the first shot, again, um, you see a struggle between Travis McMichael and Mr. Aubrey. During that struggle, Mr. Aubrey, while he was wearing a white shirt during this incident, during that struggle, you see the front of his shirt is saturated with blood. He's already saturated with blood before the, the struggle that you can see on the video. Well, that's correct. During the struggle, it was mere seconds after the first shot, his front of his um, shirt is saturated with blood. Okay. Um, because this is somewhat of a complicated situation, just doing it um, orally, do you think it would be a benefit to the court and this judge, who's the finder of fact, to use a map to sort of describe the sequence of events as we're able to piece it together uh, based on interviews and video that you've reviewed? I do, yes, sir. Judge, we had brought uh, to court today uh, a map, and uh, I know this year not the ideal uh, setting in terms of use of technology because we are having to utilize the technology for the benefit of the defendants who are observing remotely. Um, the defense also brought a map, and I think we have a joint agreement that we will tender one of those maps. It's a blow-up map as a demonstrative aid so that we can use this to help articulate the sequence of events. Is that an accurate statement? That's correct, Your Honor. Okay. Right. We agree. I don't know anything about it, but we'll, we'll go along. So, for our purposes today, I will tender this blow up as a demonstrative aid as State's Exhibit Number One. We have a smaller version here in court that's very similar. And what I'll suggest to the court is that uh, during a break, maybe we photograph or get a smaller digital photograph of this to make it part of our record. Uh, I understand that the defense might want to take this map with them when they leave, and the state has no objection to that, so long as we make a record about what the map looks like. Is, is everybody in agreement with that? Yes, sir. All right, we're going to go with that. So, again, Judge, I know these are not the ideal circumstances, and we are truly appreciative of court being accommodating to us uh, as we try to navigate through this pandemic and the, the issues that we're, we're facing here. But I think that during our test run, the best way we're able to do this, this will be the state's exhibit number one that we'll send to the defense. If I situate this uh, appropriately, I believe that everyone can see that on the video. Let's get confirmation by thumbs up or otherwise. Can you, Jesse, can you turn it this way a little bit? I can. Yeah. Just trying to get the glare off of it. Yeah. 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 Glare. Is that okay with you? I see glare on the corner, but otherwise you're satisfied. We're satisfied. I'm going to hand you this pointer if you please extend that. Uh, Agent John Doc, and then I'm going to try to hold this describe uh, what is depicted here for the benefit of Judge Harold. This is the Satilla Shores neighborhood. And then uh, show generally the entrance into Satilla Shores that you had <coughs> talked about. This is the entrance up here to Satilla Shores. And um, you had talked generally about a house under construction. Let's talk about the locations that you've talked about during your testimony before we go into the chronology a little bit more. Certainly. Um, again, this is Tiller Drive that comes down. This would be approximately the residence that was under construction. Um, and that would belong to Mr. Larry English. Uh, this is marked as 230 Tiller Drive. This is uh, Greg and Travis McMichael's residence where they resided. Um, down Burford, it would be within this area here is William Bryan's residence um, along Burford. 
And then what about Holmes Drive? Do you see that depicted here as well? Yes, this is Tillage Drive here. This is Holmes Road. The intersection, the shooting incident took place about here. Based on the chronology that you just described for the court, please show where Mr. Arbery would have initially entered this neighborhood. He would be in the neighborhood from up here, which is the entrance. Again, um, along Satilla Drive is where the house of construction is, and that's where you first see him. We have him on video. It's coming along Satilla Drive in this direction and coming into the house. Will you uh, make sure that you speak up really I'm loudly since our court reporter is now uh, I'm facing, facing your back? And I trust you'll give me an indication if you, if you can. I'm, I'm, you, man. I'm sorry. Yes, uh, the, this is still a drive when you come in from the front. If you'll come here, this is the house under construction. We have video of Mr. Aubrey as he's coming in this direction down still a drive when he enters into the home that's under construction. I don't think we've explicitly covered times yet, um, but was this broad daylight? It was, yes. It was uh, approximately 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Okay. So it's the afternoon? Yes, sir. And what about weather conditions? Sunny? Sunny, clear. Yes, sir. Uh, describe now the chronology based on the statements that you all have of the defendants and the video that you pieced together of where Ahmad Arbery initially traveled and what transpired involving the two pickup trucks. Certainly. So, uh, again, Mr. Aubrey is inside the house that's under construction. The neighbor um, comes out, sees him. He is standing approximately here. Um, he's the one that calls 911. Police are on their way. Yes, sir. Police are on their way. Let me ask you this. Did any police officers actually respond in such haste that they were able to hear anything? Yes, sir. The first responding officer, again, he is coming back um, down here. He then hears the gunshots, as, um, and he, he notes that in his uh, body cam footage. Not to keep interrupting you, but if you will describe the path of travel of Mr. Arbery per statements and video. Certainly. Again, Mr. Aubrey comes out of the residence under construction, then heads south along Satilla Drive. You see him on the video um, as he comes in this direction. This, again, is Greg McMichael and Travis McMichael's house. Um, Greg McMichael's statement is that he goes in and tells Travis. They then grab their weapons. On the video, you see Travis, what appears to be Travis McMichael's truck come out of the 2.30 still drive and, and go in this direction and pursue Mr. Aubrey. Um, according to their statements, Mr. Aubrey then comes down Satilla Drive. He then goes on to uh, Burford Road. Again, he comes by Mr. Bryan's house, which will be in this area here. Um, there's video. He's going back and forth and by, or by Travis Michael's truck at this point. Um, then according to statements, um, Mr. Albrecht goes down Buford. Travis Michael is pursuing him down Buford. Um, at, before they get to the turn here, Mr. Aubrey turns back and goes back north along Buford. This is when Greg McMichael gets out of his vehicle. Um, in the meantime, Mr. Bryan has decided to go in pursuit himself. He has entered his truck. He sees Mr. Aubrey coming um, down Buford. He pulls out on the roadway and attempts to block him in and stop him. Uh, Mr. Aubrey goes around his truck. At this point, Mr. Bryan is in pursuit of Mr. Aubrey, trying to stop him, trying to detain him. Uh, Travis Michael has made the decision to, instead of going back this way, to go around Buford to when it turns into Zellwood here, and to come back along all the way up Zellwood and turn down Holmes Road. Mr. Travis Michael's statement is to try to cut him, cut Mr. Aubrey off. I want to pause and ask you some questions of what you just articulated for the court. There was a point in time, at least one, where Mr. Aubrey's path of travel was redirected, correct? Yes, sir. And um, was it redirected in such a manner that had he continued straight, he would have been able to leave the Satilla Shores neighborhood? Yes, sir. And um, was Mr. Arbery ever able to leave this neighborhood based on the evidence that you have? No, sir. He was killed before he exited the neighborhood. You, you talked, based on my questioning, on direct about the two vehicles, the two pickup trucks in this neighborhood separating at, at, various, at, at one point. Um, describe in more detail the path of travel of both of the trucks after they separated, essentially. Certainly. Uh, Mr. Bryan, again, is headed you know, generally north on Buford, back towards the Tiller Drive in pursuit of Mr. Aubrey. Because that's the direction Mr. Aubrey is going at this point, is back towards the Tiller Drive, which is the way he has come into the neighborhood, in the, and um, he's going back the way he came. Of course, Travis McMichael, as I said, 
he is at this point on Buford, instead of going back in pursuit, he decides to loop around according to his statement and try to cut off Mr. Albury by going down Holmes Road. Was Mr. Arbery redirected by Mr. Bryan's vehicle such that he could not make it straight out of the exit of this particular neighborhood? That's correct. Uh, again, Mr. Bryan has stated that he tried to um, stop and detain Mr. Arbery several times. At one point, actually Mr. Bryan goes on Satilla Drive. Mr. Arbery, being pursued by Mr. Bryan, turns down Holmes Road quickly to the point where Mr. Bryan has to turn around and then go down Holmes Road. So he's pursuing, Mr. Arbery's going down Holmes Road towards Zellwood. Mr. Bryan is coming uh, behind Mr. Aubrey on Home Road towards Zellwood while Travis Michael is turning off of Zellwood on the Home Road coming back towards Mr. Aubrey. Is this the point that you just articulated for the court earlier this morning that the two vehicles were essentially facing each other, uh, almost pitting uh, Ahmad Aubrey in, in between the two? Yes. That's correct, yes. And um, describe, if you will, what happened next based on the video and the statements that you have uh, that were obtained as part of this investigation. Yes. Um, on Holmes Road, according to the video and the statements, Mr. Aubrey turns and goes back towards Mr. Bryant. Um, we do not know from the investigation at this point whether he saw Mr. Michael's truck at this point, but that's a reasonable conclusion at this point. Um, but he turns around, goes back towards Mr. Bryant, goes around Mr. Bryant's truck. Mr. Bryant then pulls off the road um, because Mr. Travis and Michael's truck is coming back towards Mr. Um, Aubrey. And um, Mr. Bryan then, after Travis and Michael's truck passes, gets back onto Holmes Road and proceeds back towards the intersection of Holmes Road still drive in pursuit of Mr. Aubrey and Travis and Michael's truck. Is this the point in time where both the vehicles are essentially facing the same direction? It is, yes. And um, this roadway, is, obviously we're just looking at a map here. You've been to it, correct? Yes, sir. Is it a wide roadway or is it fairly narrow? It's fairly narrow, yes. Why don't you describe, first of all, had Mr. Aubrey been able to make it to the in, the, uh, the intersection here of Holmes, and I guess that's Satilla, had he made a right there, had he been able to make a right, where would he have been able to go? He would have gone up Satilla Drive and out of the neighborhood. And what's across from this neighborhood that you've given some testimony about before? Uh, there's Highway um, 17 is here, and across Highway 17 is the entrance into Mr. Aubrey's neighborhood. It goes back into where he lives. His neighborhood is right across the highway? Yes. All right. Now, um, we pick up here with some of the video that you've observed that Mr. Bryan took, correct? Yes. Uh, describe where generally the sequence of events occurred in terms of the, the fatal shooting of Mr. Aubrey on Holmes Drive. So, um, Travis Michael at some point has gotten in front of Mr. Aubrey. He actually stops right about here near the intersection of Holmes Road and Satilla Drive. That's where he stops his vehicle. It is facing towards the intersection of Satilla Drive with the rear of the vehicle facing back down Holmes Road. Uh, Mr. Bryan, it, from the video, is coming down Holmes Road. Mr. Aubrey is between the two trucks. He's trapped in between the two? Yes. Okay. Um, Mr. Bryan, then you see there's a slight curve in the vehicle, which would be approximately this curve here. Um, Mr. Aubrey is coming towards um, Mr. McMichael's truck. Mr. McMichael is outside of the driver's side of the truck, armed with the shotgun at this point. Um, Mr. Aubrey then comes, sees Mr. McMichael, changes and goes around the passenger side of the vehicle, not towards Travis Michael, but around it. Um, and then Travis Michael changes his position to the front of the vehicle, and at that point is when Mr. Aubrey sees Travis Michael change the position in front of the vehicle and then engages Mr. McMichael. That's when the shooting took place? Yeah, the first shot, yes sir. After the first shot, then, um, because Travis Michael doesn't back up during the first shot, after the first shot, there's the physical confrontation. You see Travis Michael backing up. Um, there is a physical altercation at this point. Um, you see that uh, here, the second shot is off camera as well, but you do see the, the blood mist coming into the camera screen. Then you see um, them both Travis McMichael and Mr. Aubrey are fighting. They come back into the, the view of the screen, then you see the third shot. But th this is all, the altercation you talk about, is all after that first shot to the chest that, that Travis McMichael made an admission about. Yes, sir. That's correct. And for the benefit of our record, I thought I, I heard this, and I know it's a, a minor error, but I want to make sure we're making a record. I think you said uh, the curb or bend of the vehicle. You meant bend in the road. Road. Right? I meant the road. Yes, okay. sir. Yes, I apologize. Sir. I just wanted to make sure that we're accurate on, yes, on that point. All right. Thank you, sir. I'm going to set this here, and uh, I'm going to let you hold that in case there's any cross that you might need it for.
during the investigation of this case, you're aware of the cause and manner of death as um, determined by the Georgia Bureau of Investigation's Medical Examiner's Office, correct? I am. And can you please articulate for the benefit of the court and our record cause and manner of death? Cause was gunshot wound, manner was homicide. Um, I want to talk about statements of the defendants. Um, there were statements of all three defendants that were given to a number of investigators in the case, including Glenn County Police Department. That's correct. First, focusing on Greg McMichael's statement, was there any body cam video obtained showing statements that he made to responding officers? There was, yes, sir. And just summarize any admissions or statements that he made to Glenn County Police officers. Greg McMichael um, pretty much relates uh, on the body cam footage and then later on whenever there's, he actually is interviewed on camera by the Glenn County Police Department. Uh, he makes admissions to seeing Mr. Aubrey running down the roadway. Um, his statement to the effect is he didn't know Mr. Aubrey had stolen anything or not, but he had a gut feeling that Mr. Aubrey may have been responsible for thefts that were in the neighborhood previously. Um, and he actually, I think he actually says gut, his um, instinct told him that. He then um, tells Travis McMichael, he then describes the pursuit of Mr. Aubrey. He um, says that during Greg McMichael's statement, he only hears two shots during his statement. Um, it appears by looking at his description of events that he either didn't realize the first shot or didn't register it. Um, he was um, admits to being on the phone with 911 when the shooting, uh, the first the shooting was occurring on his way. Did he make any admissions to you about Mr. Bryan at some point <coughs> volunteering to join into this chase of Mr. Arbery in, in the neighborhood? And how did he describe that? Yeah, he, he described that Mr. Brown was trying to um, block him in as well. Okay. And um, at the point of the actual shooting itself, did Mr. Greg McMichael make any admissions to Glenn County investigators about any statements that he was making to Travis McMichael about what he sure shouldn't do? Yes. Um, he says on the um, body camera footage of the first officer, he tells him that he was telling Travis McMichael, don't, don't shoot. Despite that, did you have video footage showing that essentially Greg McMichael is covering Travis with a 357? I, I do, yes. Sir. And what did uh, Greg McMichael say about Travis's uh, shooting of the victim in terms of where he shot him specifically on his body? Uh, chest. Okay. Similarly, was there a video footage, both body cam and also interview footage of Travis McMichael and his assertions about what happened on this date. Yes, Travis McMichael's um, particularly uh, interview was done at the Glen County Police Department with him where he went into detail. Did, did Travis McMichael make any admissions about ordering the victim at gunpoint to try to get on the ground or anything like that? Yes, he did. Prior to the shooting? Prior to the shooting, yes, sir. And what about any admissions that were made about the fatal shooting itself? Um, he admits to firing his um, shotgun three times. He says that all three shots struck the victim, and he said that the first shot was to the chest of the victim. Prior to that, had Mr. Travis McMichael A made any admissions about um, choosing to chase the victim with his pickup truck you described? Yes. He was the driver of that truck? He was the driver of the truck, yes. I now want to turn uh, your attention to Mr. Roddy Bryan. And um, are you aware of any admissions that he made both to Glenn County Police Department as well as investigators with the Georgia Bureau of Investigations about his role in this particular crime that led to the arrest warrants you obtained? Uh, yes, sir, I am. Can you describe generally for the court some of the specific admissions that were made by Mr. Bryan? Mr. Bryan admits to um, joining the pursuit of Mr. Aubrey. He admits to trying to block Mr. Aubrey in, trying to detain him. Um, several times, uh, both uh, before the, Mr. Aubrey turned onto Holmes Road and then while on Holmes Road. Did he make any admissions to using his vehicle to redirect the victim within the Satilla Shores neighborhood prior to the fatal shooting? Yes, he did. 
And did he talk about um, the victim doubling back and trying to get away from this vehicle? He did, yes, several times. Did he confirm for you that the video you've now seen and collected was made by him on his cell phone? He did. Did he also confirm, he being Mr. Bryan, that he saw Travis stopped in the middle of the roadway as Mr. Bryan was driving after Mr. Arbery leading to the fatal shooting? He did. of this witness being able to identify the McMichaels because they're seen on video, but because the defendant has waived his presence for Mr. Bryan, we're not able to do an in-court identification. And are you stipulating to identify? We will. Okay. okay. So for our record, I'll ask the court to accept that stipulation that Mr. Bryan, though not present for this particular hearing, has been identified had this witness been able to be asked about that particular uh, issue. All right, I would accept that. Thank you, sir. The last thing that I think I need to talk to you about, well, the last couple things, this is going to involve an uncomfortable conversation, and you and I have talked about this a couple of times. Is that correct? Yes, sir, we have. Um, you know that I want to ask you about a particular quote um, that Travis McMichael stated on the crime scene that was overheard by one of the defendants and shared with investigators prior to police arriving. Correct. That's correct, yes, sir. And though this may be an uncomfortable conversation for the benefit of the court and for the record, um, we're making it clear that this is not your quote, it's not the GBI's quote, this is a quote from a statement of Mr. Bryan as to what he heard Travis McMichael say prior to the police arriving, correct? Very much so, yes, sir. Um, understanding that and understanding that it might be a, a little uncomfortable to talk about the words because it involves a, a curse word and something else, I need to ask you about that quote. Can you please articulate for the court what Mr. Bryan said he heard Travis McMichael say prior to police arriving and after the fatal shooting? Yes, um, Mr. Bryan said that after the shooting took place, before police arrival, while Mr. Aubrey was on the ground, that he heard Travis Michael make the statement. Since becoming involved in this investigation, you've acquired a number of other videos that have been reviewed, is that right? Yes, sir, that's correct. And uh, I want to ask you, because we're talking about principles involving a uh, party of the crime and things like that, have you also had an opportunity, you and your agency, to review any jail recordings? We have, yes, sir. So I want to ask um, a couple of things regarding the jail recordings and also about conversations between the defendants prior to the arrest. Was there a delay before um, you were in involved in the case and able to secure the arrest warrants that are the subject of this preliminary hearing? There was, yes, sir. Have you uh, had an opportunity to review whether there's any evidence that the defendants <coughs> communicated with each other after the fatal shooting but prior to the arrest warrants in this case? Yes, sir, I have. And tell the court what you found about that since we're talking about party to the crime and conspiracy culpability in just a few minutes. Yes, we um, have uncovered evidence through statements that um, Greg McMichael had conversation with um, Mr. Bryan concerning the video and the incident. Okay. And specifically, have you acquired a jail call where uh, any of the McMichaels refer to Mr. Bryan in a favorable way? I have. During a jail call that um, my agency obtained and reviewed, um, Greg McMichael was on the phone with a um, caller. The caller asked him about Mr. Bryan uh, at first, Mr. McMichael says he can't talk about it, and then he says that Mr. Bryan is an ally. He uses the term ally referencing his co-defendant, Mr. Bryan. He does. This is after um, the McMichael's arrest, but prior to Mr. Bryan's arrest? That's correct. Just a moment. I think that's all I have at this time, Judge. All right. Uh, have the defendants so made a decision about the order of cross-examination? Yes, Your Honor. Would you I will would begin. All right. Well, I'm trying would to you proceed point. to cross-examine? Judge, if we could take uh, a brief recess, I do need to speak with All right. my client, and I need to talk about what we'll, we'll take a 15-minute break. Thank you, Judge.
آواز 